much for having me here. Um, over the next 20 minutes, I want to give you a view on quantum computing in drug discovery. And um, I purposely phrased it the way I did. It's drug design on quantum computers. And I want to give you a fact-based, zero-hype perspective where we really are and what we need to actually make quantum fly for pharma. My name is Clemens. I'm the CTO of Beringer Ingelheim. I have the luxury of also having uh, an entire team focusing on, uh, focusing on quantum research uh, at Beringer. And uh, I'll also present you three results um, where we are and also uh, the team uh, that we decided to build in order to get to something meaningful when it comes to quantum. Oops. So, Bering Ingelheim, in brief, we are the largest family owned uh, pharmaceutical in the world, um, founded in uh, 1885, still headquartered uh, in Ingelheim, Germany, next to Frankfurt. And if you take one thing away from it, we were the first partner of quantum AI in the pharma industry. Um, so, a lot of the work, uh, or some of the work I present today, has also been uh, done together with, um, with Google, and, uh, but also QC work. So, drug discovery. Why are we doing all this, right? And why do we think quantum actually, in fact, can help us here? Well, drug discovery is not just expensive, but also it's risky, right? We talk about an enormous solution space of potential molecules that fit to this one protein or one target that we identified in the first stage of discovery research or target identification. This protein that is in the pathway to either progress the EDCs, create the disease and whatnot, right? And from this enormous solution space of 10 by the power of 60, we have to get down to this one candidate. One candidate that is not toxic, that we sent into clinical development. And it takes us years. Aside the fact that it's expensive and risky, it's actually really rewarding. Uh, my uh, dad-in-law just passed away uh, on an ICU. And if you're in an ICU and you see actually a drug uh, of your company being there and trying to help someone to breathe better, you know what you work for. Or if someone has a stroke uh, and is injected uh, uh, an antidote to clear the clot to survive. This is our world. And it's pretty simple. Everything and anything we can do to find a little bit of better drug, a little bit smaller of a human dose, will create direct benefit. The lesser the dose, the less side effects. This is powerful. And this is why we go after quantum. Because we want to ensure that we find even better drugs than today. And it's plenty of tools and methods that we use today. Anything and everything that ML can give us, or modern statistics, we employ across the world to find these drugs better, uh, to find better drugs quicker. And if you're curious, of course, there's a paper on the archive as well that explains this in glorious detail. So, if you look at use cases across the pharmaceutical value chain, especially research and development, right? There is, there's kind of five we, we really look at uh, deeply. First one is imaging of tissues. I mean, guess what? The better, uh, the better images we get on, uh, um, on the disease, on cells that are infected, on cancer cells, the better we can understand the disease, right? And these are usually cuts taken, uh, freezing cold or NMR based to really get prints of the disease progressing. And then there's obviously the two famous ones, right? There is molecular dynamics. How are molecules evolving over time? And binding affinity. Is something binding, which is sort of the holy grail of pharma, right? The, some, the better something binds, the longer it binds, the better it is. And the lesser dose we need in order to make it bind and make it bind sustainably, the lesser side effects you have. And then we talk about all this piece of side effect predictions and admit properties, right? Admit everything from taking a chemical entity absorbing it all the way to metabolizing it and excreting it. And here we also believe that our, um, quantum can help us with quantum mechanical properties to employ inside the prediction models. We purposely don't look yet at uh, ideas around optimization, supply, trial site selection, and whatnot. We really look at the core of pharmaceuticals, right? Of R&D, of the research drug discovery world. So, and I'll present you some results going forward on those two topics, because they are really at the core of what we are doing. And it may also give you a good view of where we really are and what we really need to make quantum fly for us and pharma. So, ground state energies. And a lot of the work that, were, that was done until to date in the chemistry world, right, where we think that there is the first advantage to be seen, has been around the ground state energy, right? 
of a given uh, molecule. So what did we do? Well, we took a, uh, an enzyme. And we took a pharma-relevant enzyme, of course, and not just one enzyme. And that is actually P450, which is really responsible inside the metabolist chain of how you take something and then metabolize it to bring value, right? So it's P450 in this case. It's a hemp protein, and it plays a key role in the metabolism, as I said, right? And if you look at fault tolerance, right, what are the resources you need? And what are the algorithms you have at hand? Well, in reality, in the, in, in the beautiful world of IFTQC, you have QP, quantum phase estimation, right? Um, well, let's take a look. So the original system size, if you want to look at the entire beast, is 500 orbitals. If you shrink it down to the active space, so the thing that we believe is actually meaningful and has something to do with the ground state, we shrink it down to 58 orbitals. And what do we need in terms of resources? Well, we need 1,400 logical qubits, and we need roughly 8 billion gates. 8 billion. And that's one thing, just a hardware requirement, right? In order to calculate this one single data point, we talk about three days. Three days. Now, if you remember back what I told you earlier, right? 10 by the power of 60 solution space shrinking and getting from 10,000 molecules to one meaningful that we send into clinical development, or let it be a couple more. And we need for one energy data point, three days. I think you can pretty quickly see that there is quite some way to go. Is if you tell a researcher, hey, for one result, you're going to need three days, and that is one data point. And if you think about molecular dynamics, where you have like a million of those to see time evolution towards binding over time, we talk about a million three times three days. So, welcome to the current state. And it's an exciting state. It's actually a state that opens so many fields to look into and understand the problems that are currently there when it comes to algorithms, when it comes to state overlap, to the problem Garnet Chen describes, and so many other bits and pieces. And this is just the simplest of all. This is where enormous research went into uh, for the last couple of years to get us down from many, 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 many more gates and qubits to this is it. And hopefully there is more to come. So that's part one. It's one ground state energy, right? Now let's talk about the real problem we have in pharma and that we look at after. And that's binding affinities, right? Really binding of protein to uh, to, uh, to the compound, or compound ligand uh, and, uh, and the protein, right? So usually you would go and say, hey, we take a supermolecular approach to figure out what is the binding energy between uh, two monomers, right? And how does the thing evolve, um, bind over time? Is it a good candidate in order to be able to rank? And we did quite some work together with one of our um, really great partners. Um, I don't know if Rob is in the room, but it's QCware. And we looked at how would you do this actually on NISC, right? Because, I mean, our current world is NISC. Um, so let's see what we can do with NISC, right? And NISC has all sorts of, uh, of issues, right? I mean, there's the famous measurement problem, then there is noise, which, which is a problem in itself, and many other things. But nonetheless, I mean, we drove it quite a bit down in terms of research requirements for pharma-relevant systems, and we would still need a roughly 2,000 gates, right? A 2,000 two-qubit gates in order to have anything meaningful on NISC. Now, if you think about what IBM announced, the famous 100 by 100 challenge, right? 100 qubits with 100 gates, it's great. But there's quite some work to get to 2,000 in order to make something meaningful for us, right? And we say, okay, NISC, you can believe in, all good. Let's take a look at what would happen if you look into the fault tolerant world with having QPE at hand and um, see what we need there. Voila. Fault tolerant. 6,300 plus qubits, logical qubits. This is the real number, 100 quintillion gates. Let me not talk about the runtime. I can tell you, it's quite a bit. And likely quite a bit uh, that goes way over my generation and many others. This is where we currently are. And you know what? That should not say this is going to be forever impossible. It's certainly not. But it's a call to action. It's a call to action for all of us 
to go after all the topics that research scientists around the world currently identify to make quantum viable for us. And I can tell you, if you look at reaction chains and many other things, the previous numbers I've shown are actually pretty small. Oh. In order to go after problems like this, you need to build a team. And that's the reason why we built our team the way we did. Uh, and I'm super lucky and actually super fortunate uh, to not just be supported by, obviously, Beringer, but also uh, having found those, uh, those guys, right? We found Matthias uh, um, half a world away with a super strong quantum chemistry background. If you want to go after quantum chemistry, well, you better have someone that knows quantum chemistry, right? We found Nikolai in Zurich at IBM, who has done plenty of research on quantum computing, left to right, up to down, over the last decade. Raffaele comes from Bristol, um, worked with Jeremy and others um, on photonics, really experimentalist view. And Michael, actually, from Volkswagen. Um, and what I want to show you with that is the diversity of team you need if you look at the current state of quantum computing. You don't have this wonderful abstracted API and there's no nothing you need to do, like with TensorFlow or anything, or just say tk.learn or anything and then tk predict and you're done with it, right? This is hard research. This is hard research and that hard research is not just with the team that you have internally and that we were so lucky to find, but also with great partners. Um, and, and we really looked at the partner ecosystem in terms of what could they bring to the table to really partner with us on the same level, not in a supplier-client um, relationship, but in a same view on eye level research relationship, right? And there is, of course, Google. There's the University of Toronto with Alain, with, um, with Nathan. There's QCWare with Rob. Um, there's the University of Luxembourg. There's PsyQuantum. And then there's also QTech, where we actually put quite some work into um, which is uh, the Quantum Applications and Technology Consortium in Germany, and a few others. But what I, what I want to tell you with that is don't see quantum research as something you should externalize and say, you know what, I don't care. Um, I'll, I'll get on the train when everything is there and everything is solved. There's just too many things that we need to solve in order to get there. And that's our contribution to it. So. What's the conclusion? And then I open up for questions. Classical algorithms have way too many approximations to be predictive for us. Everything we can do to understand binding and molecules better at FCI level will benefit our drug development cycle in various forms, shapes, and directions. And that's the reason why we go after it. Number two, today's algorithms on quantum computers are only advantages for a very few systems. And there is this magic term that I think everybody knows by now. It's called strong correlation. Well, it took us half a year to figure out if one molecule, actually one enzyme, is in fact st uh, strongly or dynamically correlated, P450. If you look at it from an industrial uh, application, needing half a year to even figure out is something uh, strongly correlated and run DMRG all the way until it breaks just to then find the advantage. Pretty far away from any industrial advantage, right? Because our job is to invent drugs and to find drugs. But that's what's currently needed to actually find this quantum advantage. Where is this demarcation line? And we need to figure out, is there algorithms that go actually way beyond strong correlation? Because at least for pharma, there's only going to be that many. And I can tell you, it's not going to be a hell load. So to generate real quantum advantage uh, for the industry, we need th three things. For one, we need to drastically improve existing quantum algorithms uh, for any sort of energy calculation. And again, right? if you think the only thing we need is ground state energy, nope, there is way more. There is dipole moments. There's many other bits and pieces. There's forces and atomic forces we need for MD, and not just one ground state energy, one single measure. We need to find and develop algorithms for very novel applications, right? And really look hard, what can we do to actually not just have QPE at hand, but find smarter ways to look at, Q, uh, at QPE 
and especially at, at the gazillion iterations of QPE that we have today when we go beyond ground states. And we need hardware in order to create heuristics to really understand what's possible on the box. So what I want to leave you with is actually two things. For one, it will take us years of research, of hard, basic, and applied research to not need a hundred quintillion gates and to not need way too much runtime. We know we get the accuracy. And now it's time to go after speed. And that's also our call to find the army of the willing that goes into research, that buys into solid research to join us and go after these problems. And number two, please, less hype. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Questions, please. Oh, okay, one in the front row. Yeah, microphones, please. Oh, they're coming around. This gentleman. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and for putting everything in perspective and very clear. I uh, really appreciate that. I have a question regarding the benchmarking for the different use cases mm -hmm. or the, let's say, the cost estimation. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you believe that the improvement will only be on algorithms or do you think it's also related to the hardware? Like, uh, just to clarify the example, let's suppose a, s a specific quantum architecture for a computer might be more suitable for one type of problem. Great question. Um, all these are hardware agnostic estimates. There is compiler work, there is compiler optimization um, that surely will be able to bring this down. But if you look at it in perspective, there is equally, if not way more, to gain on, on the algorithm itself. Next question. Hi. So uh, my name is Hani Peck. I'm from IBM Quantum, uh, senior scientist from IBM. And the, just so your estimation of the resources mm -hmm. probably is based on surface code or some type of error correction. It is, of so, course. Yes, because I wanted to make a comment that, you know, it really depends on the what kind of error correction codes that uh, you need, uh, you know, how many gates and how many physical mm -hmm. and the logical qubits rate. Sure. Um, and then also nowadays we, a lot of scientists are developing the error mitigation techniques such that, you know, we can also, you know, apply some of the algorithms with the uh, existing hardware. Um, You're right. Yes. And um, I mean, maybe, and then also there are, are algorithms that can use both quantum and classical. I mean, it's a very common technique in uh, quantum chemistry that you can embed, you know, different types of algorithms in mm -hmm. different hardwares also. Maybe then at the end, uh, my question is the, what will be the direction that, uh, you know, pharma should go to adapt the quantum computing for your, your business? As I said, right, we will go after one problem after the other. That's the answer, right? I mean, obviously, you can't just put the state on a quantum computer and you know, right? There is quite a lot of uh, classical pre-processing that needs to happen, and even more so classical post-processing that needs to happen, okay. especially in the NISC world, right? Where the game is actually enti almost entirely on uh, the HPC cluster, right, in front, in order to optimize externally, right? So we will go after all these topics, one by one, together with the IBMs, together with the Googles. So we employed everything we knew uh, for estimating P450, together with Quantum AI, together with, uh, with QSimulate, right? And let me tell you, right, if I need QPE all over again and again and again and again, I can strip down every little bit of QPE I know. If I need 30,000 times QPE, it's still going to be QPE. So there is things that we need to go after. My call here was actually to give you a very realistic cutting-edge view on all the things that need to happen. And we are, as many others, committed to actually go that route. Because one part is the academic research that will lay the ground foundation. But in reality, the true value comes in the applied research. Because even if we make three days to be one day, it's still not half as good as we need it. And this can only happen if academia and industry truly join forces. And that is sort of my call. Thank you. We have, let's take a question from the other side. We have one ready, and then we'll come thanks, back. Thanks for a really great talk and some powerful messages made. Uh, you, you noticeably, you had a laser focus on the quantum chemistry applications. Mm -hmm. uh, you notably didn't talk about uh, optimization in the more industrial sense of mm -hmm. clinical trials. 
Uh, how much should we read into that and how you feel about those applications? I will only comment to things that we, where, where we have seen or researched solid scientific evidence. I, that's the reason why I framed the talk the way I did. Um, no hype, fact-based, um, to say this is the research results. It doesn't mean that we will not look. I mean, Michael has spent uh, uh, at Volkswagen uh, quite a bit of, uh, on research on optimization, various other topics, right, or, or problems. I mean, obviously, it's, uh, it, it's a car maker, right, and not a pharmaceutical. So I'll not comment to this. We have time for one more question here, please. Thank you very much. Um, I have one question, sure. which would be rather about the quantum em embedding. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question would be, have you have you tried it? And if you did, what's, what's your view on that? So we tried a lot of things um, to, uh, to see what we could drive where. And um, in the NISC era especially, I mean, embedding can, can run in two worlds. Um, NISC brings all sorts of other problems with it, right? Um, measurement, the, the famous measurement uh, apocalypse and, and other things, right? Um, let's see. There is, and you're right, I mean, there is every day, if you take a look at, at nature or the archive, uh, right, there's many techniques coming out, and that's what I also kind of alluded to, to, the, to the question you had, right, um, of progress on so many bits and pieces and fields, right? So kind of what I'm presenting today may actually not hold in, in, in the numbers I presented. That's the reason why I also presented rough numbers to some extent uh, tomorrow. And I will celebrate, and I'm deadly se dead serious on this, I'll celebrate every little bit of better surface code, of embeddings, of block encodings, and of many other topics to get these numbers down in order to create meaningful advantage for a patient. Because in reality, that is our job. Our job is to find better drugs. And I love to do quantum with my team, but we should have the, the site in, uh, in view, right? And the final goal. And the final goal is actually make this support research scientists to find better drugs. <laughs>